God loves, but he also hates. You can't separate them. You can't separate, you, you can't separate God from this. There is, that's what I'm saying. There's two advents. There's one God comes in grace. God says, I come not to condemn the people. I come to love. I come to save. I come to shed my blood. Second time I come, and I come to shed your blood. And I come to destroy, and I come with vengeance, and I come with anger, and I come with wrath. Trust me, you don't want God then. If you don't want God now, you will not want God then. Your choice. Have you been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you been cleansed when God comes down? Are you going to be with him on the white horse? Are you going to be with one of the riders? Are you going to be in heaven and looking down? Or are you going to be down looking up? I want to be up there looking down. I do not want to be down here when he's coming. And neither do you. Trust in the Bible. There are two times he's coming back. Right now, you're between the, the cross and the crown. Get ready before he puts on his crown. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many days toils and snares I have already come this grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand Shining as the sun, we no less days to sing God's praise than when we first believed. Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of First Peter. Go to the book of First Peter. First Peter chapter one. Let's read there in verse one. The Bible says this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace, grace unto, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. 
Verse 10 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and search diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in, which was in them that did sanctify, when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it is was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto that they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your love, your passion, your mercy, Lord. We do ask that you be here this morning. Give me the gift of teaching, God. I open, ask that you open people's hearts and ears. In your name, Jesus, amen. Now, we covered, uh, the last time, we covered the first six verses that uh, Peter wrote here. We covered the first six verses, and we found a lot of, lot of good things in just six verses. And we'll find another really good things in the next six verses. Just a little preview here. Paul is writing, or Peter is writing this to the strangers scattered throughout. These are Gentile people. These are what we call us. We are Gentile people. We are not Jews. We are strangers. We were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. We were not part of Israel. We had nothing in common with God. We were uh, pigs. The Bible calls Gentile pigs. We were not someone that first Jesus said that he did not even come for us. He came for the Jewish people. But then Jesus Christ came and, and there was a dispensation, meaning that there was a time that Christ put his grace upon us, that the blood of Jesus Christ was also for the Gentile people. And therefore he says now that we are elect according to God's foreknowledge. God foreknew that one day that the Gentile people would be saved. And that is you and me. That we have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as he says that we are sanctified, there's a condition to this foreknowledge. There's a condition to those that he chooses are those that are in Christ Jesus. And we talked about that how good God is. That God does not just, just end it there by saying, look, you are saved. He also says that you have been sanctified, that grace and peace be multiplied. Do you know that their grace does not end just by you being saved? Grace continues through the rest of your life. Peace does not just, God making peace with you once, you get peace constantly throughout your Christian walk with the Lord. And we talked about how blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope. We talked about the resurrection of Christ and how we have a living hope. Our hope is not dead. We, Christ did not just die for our sins, he also resurrected for us. To an inheritance, just, re just remember this, that when, you, when Christ was resurrected, when Christ li lived again, that is now our li lively hope. It is not a dead hope. Our Savior is not dead. Our Savior is very much alive, amen? He is not dead. He is not in the grave. He did not, death could not keep him, the Bible says. Death could not keep Jesus Christ in his grave. And therefore, we now as Christians have a lively hope. We have a hope that is living. Means that one day Jesus says this, and we read this last week as well, or two weeks ago, that Jesus says that I am the resurrection. That I am the resurrection. If you believe in this, you will live forever. You will never die. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the verse where it says, the shadow of death, I walk through the valley of shadow of death. Do you know as a Christian, all you experience is the shadow of death? You don't experience real death? There was a, a father that had a, a, a few children that lost, his, they lost their mother. And the children were very sad. And one day the children, they were walking beside the highway. And there was this big truck that came beside them driving on this highway. And the, 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 the father said to the children, he said, He says, what would be worse? Getting hit by the truck or by the shadow? And the children said, well, the shadow. And he says, that is exactly what a Christian experienced. He only experienced the shadow of death. The Bible often references when a Christian dies, he says he just goes to sleep. Because one day he will resurrect, one day Christ will give him a new body, and he will never die again. 
A body that is incorruptible, a body that is undefiled, a body that will, will always just be righteous, a body that will never fade away, a body that never gets sick, a body that never has eye problems, a de- body that never has ear problems, a body that never has leg problems, a body that never has arm problems. And God says, look, this is a promise to you. You're going to get an inheritance. You're going to get this body. But then we talked about that he doesn't just leave it there. We could already shout, amen, hallelujah, Jesus is amazing. But he says, let me just give you another, another blessing here. And like I said, what Peter is doing, he's pre- preparing us for struggles, for trials. Often, like I said last, the last time I preached this, when you are about to enter a trial or when your children are about to go through something hard, maybe your children have been ever diagnosed with cancer or broken their arm or broken their leg or been in pain, when they're about to go through a surgery or some, some sort of treatment, what you do is you try to encourage them. Then encourage them by saying that, hey, look, the outcome is better for you. The outcome is going to be better. You have, there's a hope waiting at the end of the tunnel. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes even that you remind them of, of, of the good memories that, uh, that you've had as a family. You remind your children, hey, we've had some good memories, so you can kind of keep their mind off of the trials that they are about to enter. And that is exactly what Peter is doing in these, few, in these first few verses. He wants you to be reminded of where you come from and what is waiting for you. And therefore he says, look, you have a, this, you're going to have this glorified body. You're going to have this body that never dies. But I'm not going to leave you there because, like I said last time, you could say, but what if I get bored? He says, look, unto an inheritance. To an inheritance. And you say, but what if that inheritance doesn't last? He says, it's incorruptible. And then he says, but what if somebody comes and tampers with it? He says, it's undefiled. And you say, but what if I don't make it? He says, it's reserved in heaven for you. And you could say then, but what if I don't try hard enough? What if I don't do enough? And he says, you are kept. You are kept by the power of God. You are kept by the power of God unto salvation. You are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, we've just seen the goodness of God. We've just seen that the work has been done. We've just seen that struggles and our issues should just become a little bit easier. These trials should just become a little bit easier because of the things that God has, first of all, done for us. And the things that God is going to do for us. And that God keeps you. He says, God, you're kept by the power of God. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I hope you can say amen to this. The same power that created this universe by words is the same power that keeps you. The same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is the same power that keeps you. Now, you could say, I don't believe that. Or you could say, but is there just, is the power really that great? Is that power really that great that that power can keep me? If... If God can say, let there be light, and there is light, I'm sure God can keep you in your faith. Amen? I'm sure God can keep you by the power of God. Now, we covered that last time. Then the next thing he says here, he's now just given us us this, this, this beautiful promise. He's given us this reminder of where we were and where we came from. And now he says that we're kept by the power of God. We see the inheritance. And he says this next. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. Wherein what? All the things he just said in the past. You know, I, I don't understand how a Christian could not rejoice. I don't understand how, maybe you're not very loud, maybe you're not very vocal, but I don't understand how a Christian in his heart and maybe he can, cannot say amen. I don't know how a Christian could not say praise God, hallelujah. 
that we have such a great God that has given us all these blessings and has, has given us all this inheritance and, and something that does not corrupt away, how you cannot rejoice. And I mean, where we come from in our background, we usually are not very loud in the crowd and the congregation. But I find it very interesting. People that are, are usually very loud, even they go to a hockey game, they go to any sort of game, and they're shouting, and yeah, team win, team win, team win. But when they hear, start hearing the Bible, they're very quiet. Now, I think you should shout a lot louder when you hear about eternal life than when you hear about something physical good that happens. Amen? He's here about, you should be shouting a lot louder than just, you know what, good, it's good, yeah, I can hear that. But I find sometimes that we've, we, we've come so immune to this thing where it's just not reality anymore. Where we look at the grace of God and we look at the things he's done for us and, and sometimes it just seems like, yeah, but it doesn't seem like we really actually truly believe that. That we doubt it because it's been said so many times, how is this still reality? How is this true? But I heard this from a child. I heard this from so long. How can this really be true? And let me tell you, just smiling isn't you rejoicing. You know, did you know you could not smile and still rejoice? You know, Paul's experience in the book of 2 Corinthians 6.10, he says, as sorrowful, yet always, always rejoicing. Paul says, look, he, there was times that he was sorrowful, but yet he was rejoicing. You can go through hard times in life. You can go through struggles. You can go through pain. You can go through sorrow, but you can still rejoice. Because you know the outcome. It doesn't matter what you see here physically, the, 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 the things that are, the circumstance that you are in, the struggles that you are facing, the government, what he's doing. It doesn't matter what's going on, even though we find it, uh, uh, you know, saddening to see where the world is going. But you know what? We can still rejoice because we still know the outcome because one day our King Jesus is going to come and rule. Amen? And it's not going to change. No matter who it is, no matter who wants to change it, no matter how powerful, how rich physically they are, they will not change the outcome. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to reign. So he says, greatly rejoice. I've told you the, your past. I've told you the, the, the things that you were. You were a pig. You were a, a, a thief. You were a, a cusser. You were a blasphemer. You were just an evil person and I saved you. And I, now I got an inheritance for you. And now I'm going to introduce, and you are now saying, you, I know you are going to rejoice because of these things, but now listen to what he says here next. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. He says, now, you know, we've just talked about the past, we've talked about the future, but now in this present time, in this season, you are going to be in heaviness. Now, through manifold temptation. That is a lot of temptation. That is different kind of temptation. You are in heaviness. Now, I think all of us could say we've been tempted. And if you haven't, then you're a liar. <laughs> then you're tempted to lie. The temptation isn't the sin. Jesus was tempted. It is giving in to the temptation that is sin. We are men. We are women. You, are, you get tempted. There's physical things that is going to attract you. Now go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. Before I read this, one thing you'll always realize when you disobey or when people disobey it's usually because they disbelieve. They start doubting. And therefore, we'll see as Peter is writing this, he's, he keeps reminding them of the truth of Christ. He keeps reminding them of the truth of Christ. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. I have written unto you, Fathers, because you know him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. In the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome 
the wicked one. Now keep that in mind. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong in what? In the word of God abideth in you. That is a key point right there. He's about to go into the temptations. He's about to go into the lust of the eyes and all this. And he says, but you younger men, you are strong. The word of God abideth in you. Next verse. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the, wor- the, the love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What are the things, neither the things that are in the world, what are the things that are in the world that you're not supposed to love? For all that is in the world, three sins, three sins that you will be tempted with. These three. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Eve, it started, these three sins, it started with Eve. If you guys remember the story, God told them not to eat from that tree. The devil comes and he says, look, eat. And you know what Eve says? That does look good. Looks good to the eyes. It would taste good. The lust of the flesh. I know I shouldn't eat that, but man, that would feel good to my flesh. There's nothing wrong with eating. It's just when you're not supposed to eat. When God forbid you to eat something, he says, don't eat that. He says, man, but that, that fruit would be feel, oh, man, it would taste good. That's the lust of the flesh. And then she said, it, it, would look, it looks good. That, that, that fruit looks really good. What deceives, what's the next thing that deceives you? Is your eyes. I, re- I really want that. Man, and if I eat that, what did the devil say? You'll become like gods. You're going to be, you will know everything. The pride of life. Man, then God couldn't send me around anymore. Then I would be like God. Three of the sins. Jesus was tempted with the same sin. What happened when Jesus was in the, in, in, in the wilderness, when he got tempted? The devil said he hadn't eaten for 40 days and it wasn't time for him to eat yet. You know what the devil does? Jesus, this is going to be good for your flesh. See that rock right there? Just turn it into bread. It'll be good for your flesh. Lust of the flesh. We know Jesus didn't do it. Then he takes him onto this place and he says, Hey, Jesus, cast yourself down here. Cast yourself down here so the people will know who you are. And Jesus could have said, he was, that's pride of life. He was tempted with the pride of, pride of life. He could have said, man, if I just come down and all the angels, he says, the angels, the devil says, look, the angels won't let you even hurt yourself. Man, they'll float you down, Jesus. Look how good it's going to look, Jesus. When you jump down of here and all the angels, thousands of angels will bring you down and you're going to make this awesome entry. Man, you're going to be looked upon. Jesus says no. And then he says, hey, Jesus, come over here. I'm going to show you something. The lust of the eyes. I'm going to show you some riches. You bow down to me. And Jesus, I really want you to see this with your eyes. Look at all those kingdoms. Look at all those kingdoms. Keep your eyes appealed to these kingdoms, to these riches. Keep your eyes just appealed to the lights and all those things that could really be sad. Look, look upon these things. The lust of the eyes. Jesus was tempted with all, three, all these three. Eve was tempted, and so are you and I. So are you and I tempted with all of these three? It might look different. It might look different to, 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 to Jesus as it was as turning a stone into bread. To Eve, it was the, 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 the fruit on the tree. To Jesus, the lust of the eyes was to, to show him the kingdoms, show him the beauty of the kingdoms. To Eve, it was the fruit. So it might look different for you and me. It might look different for you than the next person. But let me tell you, that you'll all be tempted in these areas. The Bible says, even says, he says, look, now for a season, 
Now for a season you are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Different, diverse, different kind of temptation. And you're going to go through these temptations. Now how many of you would not want to know, hey, if I go through this through temptation, how do I not fall into these temptations? That's what we want to know. Isn't it? How many, I'm like, don't put your hand up, but, 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 but I can guarantee you there are struggles, that there's temptations that you struggle with, and you have probably pleaded with God, you've probably talked to other people and say, how can I overcome this? How can I stop doing these things? I have a gossip issue. How can I stop gossiping? And it seems it's always coming to me. I have an anger issue. How can I stop always just flipping out and getting angry? Man, I have a pornography addiction. How can I stop this pornography? I have a lying issue. How can I stop lying? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the, the, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These, are, these three sins, all other sins come into those three. How do I overcome that? And we all want to know. We all want to know, how do I overcome that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't ever become, come to a place where you're, you sit there, you're like, yeah, I, I, I don't get tempted. Oh, no, I'm beyond that. You think you're beyond with what Christ was? He says, he, him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he falls. You know, don't, don't put yourself in a situation, and I, John, John preached about this a little bit last time too, don't put yourself in a situation where the temptation is so great. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're like, Okay, well, I can't even, I have, a, I have an addiction with whatever it is, let's just say, going back to pornography or anything, and you put yourself in a position where that is so much advertised. Don't think, oh, I'm strong. Oh, I can go watch that movie, it don't bother me at all. Take heed. You think you stand? Take heed. You're putting yourself in a position where you should not be. Don't put yourself in a position, don't put yourself in a position where these temptations are greater than you can handle. Don't put yourself in a position like that. You know, John was talking about this last time. Think about it. Many people, social media, they, they go watch TikTok. They go watch these videos where it's close to pornography, pretty much. And they say, oh, no, don't bother me. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Next verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Don't think that this temptation only happens to me. Don't think, oh, this is a sin, I'm getting tempted, it must be sin. No, it is not sin to get tempted. It is sin when you give in to that temptation, amen? And he says, there is no temptation. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. You know what that means? God will never put a temptation. He will never let you get tempted. He doesn't tempt you. The devil does. But when the devil tempts you, he will never let him use this temptation that where you can't overcome that. Every temptation that you will have the God makes sure. The temptation also make you a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. If there's a temptation, God also makes a way for you to escape that temptation. There's a temptation, God will make sure that you are able to bear that temptation. Now think about this. What did he say in 1 John chapter 2, verse 14? He said, because ye are strong, and what? In the word of God abideth in you. Now, why is that so important? 
Why is that so important? Like I said, it's usually when you start doubting or disbelieving something is when you give in to temptation. It's usually when, you think about a child just for a moment here. You get a little baby and they start growing up. They're, they're optimistic. They, 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 they believe in everything. They, 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 don't, they don't have doubts. They don't have doubts. You can go hang them upside down. They will just sit there. Just hang them upside down. But then when you see adults and everybody's doubting. And you know what? It shouldn't. And I, I don't, we, we need to doubt now when people just say something to us because we can't just, we need to be a little bit skeptics. But isn't that a problem that, that, that I would say is absolutely a problem that even among the church, even among the church, people start, can't believe another person? That it's been kind of, you know, you go and talk to someone, all of a sudden you find out they gossip about you. You go and find out this person lied about something. You can, it, words mean so little. And therefore people start doubting. You start doubting because, man, I, they said that once, but it's not true. Well, that person said that once, ah, but it's not true. So you start doubting everything. But as a child, you just, man, you go tell your child something. Hey, guys, I can fly. Oh, really? Show us, Dad. They believe it. That's why he says, become like a child. You believe these things. You just believe something. Somebody tells you something. Sometimes I have to tell my kids. Sometimes kids lie and they go, you know, my kids have come home. Hey, this kid said this and this and this and this. That kid lied to you. I have to tell you that. But they just believe it. Oh, that one person said this and this. That's a lie. That's not true. You can't just believe everything. But think about how you know, when the kids start getting older, they start seeing this and they start doubting. They start doubting everybody's words. They start doubting what people are saying. They start doubting. And then guess what they go for? They don't go for facts anymore. Listen to this, guys. Listen to this. They don't go for facts anymore and truths. They go what's comforting. They go what, what comforts them. Because they've been lied to so many times, they don't even know what to base anything off of anything anymore. They don't, they keep, well, I don't know if that's true. Somebody's told me this before. So now let's just go with what comforts us. You know, I was thinking of this as our children. I've said this before. I don't know where I've said this, but I did a test on my kids to see how much they trusted me. So we had uh, stairs going down pretty on the one area. You know how there's, I just say there's stairs going down this way, and then they come back, and over here it's already quite, quite high. So I said to my kids, hey, kids, which one of you trust me? I'm going to hang you upside down with one hand. And right away with their mouth, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I trust you. Oh, yeah, yeah, hang me down. I'm like, okay, don't try this at home, guys. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, I'll do it with one hand, though. And then, okay. So I took my oldest boy, he's nine, and I I put him down. I'm like, okay, now I'm going to do it with one hand. Hey, no, Dad, how about you just do it with two hands? Just with two hands, don't do it with one. But isn't that how we kind of act when we want God? Hey, God, don't do it that way, God. God, please, please don't do it that way. Don't, don't make it that way. I don't just want to believe you and, and I can have victory. I don't just want to believe these words. I don't want just the, the, the victory that I have by, by this word abiding in me. I want it to be another way. I want it to be a seven-step program. You know, I want to go get counseling for 15 years and then I, that's how I want it to be, God, because that, that feels better. And he says, no, no, no. Trust me. Trust me. Let, me. let me use one hand, and then I'll use a pinky yet. And then all of a sudden, I'm, as, as I'm hanging him down there, and he's, he's kind of like, okay, he's going to let go, and he's grabbing onto the rails. He's like, okay, Dad, I trust you. I'm like, no, you're grabbing onto the rails. You're trying to do it yourself yet. I said, let go. Hang your ha- hands down low. Ha- hang him down, and let me, don't, don't grab onto anything. I'll do it with one hand. Finally, he does it. I'm like, man, good thing I didn't drop him because I would have been bad. He would have started doubting everything I said, right? But see, and, and then when you look at the youngest one, there's no doubt. I go put her in there. She's one. And I go like this. She's sitting there. No fear. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. But that's the issue that, that we have is, is that we start doubting. We started doubting everything because everything around us has been so corrupted. People have made promises. People have done something. So a child grows up and all of a sudden he starts doubting everything. And when you doubt things, even if you're saved, say you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been washed, you've been cleansed by the blood of Christ, but you start doubting his word. You start doubting certain other things in scripture. All of a sudden, you feel like you have no victory. 
Why does he say to this young man, you are strong? Why can he overcome? Because the word of God abideth in him. The more you know about scripture, the more you can, you can overcome sin. Obviously, we say it's the blood of Christ, but the more you trust the blood of Christ, Think about it. It sounds weird saying that, but the more you trust it, the more you know about Scripture, the more you see this is reality. This is reality. The Bible says this, and I believe it because everything is perfectly fits together so well. And you'll see Peter do this here. Let's go back to this text here. Listen to what he says in verse 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let me just stop there for a minute. The trial of your faith is more precious. It's not as precious. It is more precious than gold that perishes. Think about that a little bit. The next time you get tried, the next time you get tried, think of that a little bit. When you get tempted, the trial of your faith is precious. You getting tempted is precious. Is precious. He says, look at what he says here. Where was I? Verse 7. The gold that perishes, uh, the, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. You know what that temptation is? That trial is? That's fire. You know why they always say that, that tried with fire? Because you found out what real gold was when you tested it in fire. When you tested that re- gold in fire, hey, this is the real thing. So you know what he says? Let me see if you're the real thing. So your, your trial is absolutely precious. It is precious because when you come out, he says that right here, he says, when you come out of this fire, of this trial, you have found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I want you to go through these things. It's going to burn. It's going to burn. But when it comes out, there's going to be praise and honor and glory at the other end. Isn't that the same thing with working out? I don't know how many of you guys ever worked out when the first time, first couple times you do it and you're like, this cannot be good for me. Especially lag days. (laughs) Yeah, see, he knows. I hadn't hadn't worked out in a while and then the other day I was doing it again. I was doing lag days. I could barely walk up the stairs. And I think, is this really good for me? This must be terrible. But think about the outcome of it. The outcome is better, especially when you have a little bit of fat to lose and you start working out. The outcome is better. And he says, the trial of your faith, it's going to hurt. It's going to burn. But trust me, trust me, it's good. It's precious. It's to praise and honor. And then he says, whom? Listen to where he goes back to. This is why I was saying even You're believing something. Going back to the word of God. Whom, having not seen. So he he was just talking about the trials, the temptation, and and these things that you go going through. And then he says, but now I want to remind you of something again. Because this is where you're going to be doubting. And I want you guys to see the reality and the facts of this. This is true. And we're going to start going through some history here. We're going to go through some prophecies. And I'll tell you how real this really is. How real this belief system, this faith of Jesus Christ really is. He says, a whom having not seen, ye love. Guys, you're going through some things right now, but I, I want you to remember something. You guys have never seen Christ, have you? He says, but you love him. I, I want this to be so real. I want to remind you of where you are and where you stand. You've never seen Christ, have you? No, but you love him. Though now ye see him not, yet believing. You're not seeing him, but you're still believing. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This is where we should be. You know what? I don't see Christ. I've never seen Christ. People draw images of Christ. I don't believe that's Christ. I've never seen him, but I still believe him. 
I didn't see him hang up on the cross, but I still believe him. I haven't seen him come down in glory, but I still believe him. You know why? Because the word of God abideth in me. I believe it. I, my focus becomes on that. And all of a sudden, these struggles seem to not, these trials seem to be not so strong. These temptations seem to be easier to overcome because the word of God is in me. Because I know that Jesus Christ is real. I know that Jesus Christ is living. Even though I have not seen it, I believe it. You look at a guy like Thomas, we all want to say, wow, doubting Thomas. The other, the other disciples weren't better. The other disciples seen him first. Think about it. What happened when Mary and these people came? They came running to see if it was true. But then all of a sudden Jesus appeared to them, so they all seen him. Wow! But everybody says, hey, Thomas, he's a doubting Thomas. Well, because he didn't see it. His disciples are like, hey, we want to, they were all seen it already. But then what does he do when, when, he, when he sees him? He says, Thomas, let's just go there actually, let's read that. Let's go to John 10, 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of him, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord in my God. And he saith unto them, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. You know, I always thought, man, it would be nice I've been there with, when Jesus was walking this earth. But do you know me, you and I hold some sort of blessings that his disciples or all those that seen him do not? He says, look, you have seen, you have seen me. But I say, blessed is the man that has not seen and believes. We're in a blessed state. We're in a place where we can believe something where we have not seen it. We don't just believe blindly, we're persuaded. That's why we say, why, why do we believe this stuff? Because we are persuaded. You know, everybody's persuaded on something. Usually it's because of people. They're persuaded because somebody says something or they're persuaded because of their comforts. They're persuaded because of something. But I'm persuaded because of something eternal, amen? We're persuaded because of something eternal. I believe that Christ died on that cross. I believe that he was buried and on the third day he rose again. And I also believe that one day Christ will come back in his glory. Have I seen it? No, I believe it. And he says, blessed is the man that believeth and seeth not and still believeth. Now, I'm not going to have time to, I was like, Ken asked me if you should put the whole Bible in, 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 on the projector because I gave him so many verses. So I'm going to probably make this, uh, I'm going to finish this up here next time. But there is so much when, when uh, Peter is writing this, and he's reminding you of, look, you guys have not seen Christ, but you believe him. Even though you're going through trials and temptations, don't start doubting. Just believe it. Just like I said, our, our doubts usually come from something because someone has lied or something wasn't quite honest. But he said, look, you guys have a perfect word. You have something, a word that abideth in you, that is true, that is never going to lie. There's nothing in this book that's corruptible. There's nothing in here that's going to be deceiving you. Obviously, if you're a non-believer, but as a Christian. And he says, believe it. You guys believed Christ. You guys did not see him. You guys are going through struggles. You know what your first, your first issue is going to be? You're going to want to start doubting. When you go through struggles, your first issue is going to be, you're going to want to start doubting. God, are you going to come through as the scripture says? He says, let me just remind you of where Christ, let me just remind you of how, how true and how much of a reality this is. There's prophecies about this. Listen to what he says here. 
Whom having not seen love, whom ye, though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation? He's reminding them. I want to t- show, show you guys how real this salvation is. I want to show you guys this is supernatural. Nobody could have come up with this themselves. I want to show you guys. You're going through trials. You're going through struggles. But you guys cannot stop, st- uh, stop believing, cannot start doubting, because I want to now show you the reality of this. He says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. He said there was prophets way back, and, and, and that, I'm not going to go into that this morning because there's so many prophecies that I would like to show you guys. He says there has been prophecies that has prophesied of the grace that should come. Now, do you know the issue with what the Jews had and what most people today have? When you look at prophecy, do you know there's two comings of Christ? We would say, yes, the first coming, he comes humble, he comes meek, he comes born in Bethlehem, he comes born in a stable, he comes born and the, there's prophecies about him sacrificing himself, him suffering. There's one prophecy, and there's one prophecy, him coming, ruling, and reigning as a king. That's why they call it from cross to the crown. The first time he was looking for a cross, the second time he's going to come be looking for a crown. The first time he came, he was riding a donkey. The second he's, time he's going to come, he's going to become riding a white horse. But see, when these prophets were, were looking at what God was, see, it says that these prophets were looking diligently. So God said, hey, look, the Spirit said, write this down. And they're looking at this, and he's like, what is this meaning? How many of you have ever written something and then figured out what it meant? <laughs> we don't do that. We don't write something down and say, so what does this mean? We usually write something that we know. You, you know something and you write it down. But these prophets, they were writing something down and they were saying, what could this mean? What could these prophecies mean? Because all they seen, they were looking from, from behind the mountain. If you look at a mountain and you see, and, and Clarence Larkins uses this, he says all they seen was from behind a mountain and all they seen is two peaks. They didn't see that there was different comings. They just said, okay, this, something's, not, something's not quite adding up here. So you're saying, let's just read a one passage here. and Go to, go to Isaiah 61. Go to Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening the prisons of them that are bound. This is Christ. This is the prophecy of Christ. And then he says this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now he's talking about vengeance. Can you see Isaiah seen this and he's like, okay, you're doing all this, but then there's vengeance? Like, what? What am I writing here? They were searching diligently. What does this mean? What is he saying? What is he talking about? Because listen, go back to Peter here. Just listen to this one verse here. Verse 11. He says, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify and testified beforehand. Listen to this. Two different comings right here. The suffering of Christ, listen to the next one, that's the first one, and the glory that should follow. The Israelites, the Jews had a problem with believing the first advent. The first coming of Christ, they had a problem with it. They said, no, we want to be delivered. Yeah, we like, he's going to come on a white horse. Yes, he's going to save us and he's going to set up his kingdom and yes, we're going to have this. But he's going to come on a donkey, uh, Zechariah says. He's going to come like this. Well, let's ignore that one. Let's look at the the second one. Let's look at the second peak. But we now, we see see the mountain from the side. We can see there's actually two comings. And you know what most people have the issue nowadays? Because of the 
the first coming has already happened. Guess what people have an issue now? Believing in the second coming. People, people now have a, the, the, the Jewish people had a hard time believing a God of grace. Christians have a hard time believing on a God of wrath. Because the first time he came, he says, look, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save sinners. The second time he comes, he's not going to come to save you. He's going to come to destroy you if you're not saved in here. Most people today they don't have, they have a hard time believing the latter. The first, oh, yeah, yeah, God is grace, God is love, yes, yes. And we say, preach it. Preach the grace of God. But you're forgetting something. He's coming again. He didn't just come once. He's coming again. Oh, and when he comes, if you have not been cleansed by the first time he came, he says, look, I'm coming, and I'm going to wash your sins. The first time I come, I did not come to condemn you. I came to save you. I came to, to, to get nailed on the cross and shed my blood for your sins, for your unrighteousness. I came to live a perfect, righteous life, a humble life, born in a stable, as a baby. I came as a baby. I didn't come as a king. I came as a baby. Ah, uh, we're not okay with that. Come on, come different. And he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to be sacrificed. I'm going to be the lamb for the slaughter. Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. No, no, we want a lion, not a lamb. Put, put him away from us. If you don't want the lamb, trust me, you're not going to want the lion. If you don't want Jesus Christ on his first coming, trust me, you do not want him at your second coming because he will destroy you. Every single bone in your body will be broken. Uh, what is it, that verse? He says, you'll knock out their teeth, the, the teeth of the wicked, and break their back and throw them into, cast them into utter darkness. You say, what a cruel God. Well, you don't understand God. You don't understand God. You know what the biggest issue is? When anybody says this, I don't think that's fair God does that. You have, you have no knowledge. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs? Where's the beginning of knowledge? The fear of God. If you doubt God's wrath, you do not fear God. Your knowledge has not even begun. You know what as parents we need to do? The first thing we need to teach our kids? Teach them the fear of God. If you don't teach your children the fear of God, their knowledge has not even begun. You want to see the wrath of God, the, the, the angry of God? You teach them that. You teach them how much God hates sin. Because if you think God doesn't really hate sin and God is okay, guess what? Grace won't really mean anything to you. But when you see the wrath of God, when you see how much God hates sin, when you see what God does to sinners, you'll say, okay, wow, I have no knowledge of God. My knowledge has not even begun because the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. So we have a problem nowadays with the second coming. We have a problem with saying, really, is God going to come and destroy? Oh, yes, he will. And we're going to get into that the next time I preach. He's going to come out on a white horse. And you know what he's going to do? His eyes are going to be pierced on those that unbelieving, unregenerated unre 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 people, those that have not, been trans, uh, 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 have not been saved by the blood of Christ. He's going to have his eyes on those people. Can you just imagine that for a moment? Christ coming down on his white horse, and he's looking at you. He doesn't come there, oh, I'm going to go look at him and come down and save him. No, I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to cast you into the lake of fire. Really, what kind of God are you preaching? The God of the Bible, amen? That's the God of the Bible. God loves, but he also hates. You can't separate them. You can't separate, you, you can't separate God from this. There's, that's what I'm saying. There's two advents. There's one God comes in grace. God says, I come not to condemn the people. I come to love. I come to save. I come to shed my blood. Second time I come, and I come to shed your blood. And I come to destroy, and I come with vengeance, and I come with anger, and I come with wrath. Trust me, you don't want God then. If you don't want God now, you will not want God then. Your choice have you been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you been cleansed when God comes down? Are you going to be with him on the white horse? Are you going to be with one of the riders? Are you going to be in heaven and looking down? Or are you going to be down looking up? I want to be up there looking down. I do not want to be down here when he's coming. And neither do you. Trust in the Bible. There are two times he's coming back. Right now, 
you're between the, the cross and the crown. Get ready before he puts on his crown. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your amazing grace now, Lord. We thank you that we still have this opportunity to get together, that we have this opportunity to preach your grace, and Lord, that you are, we are still between the cross and the crown, Lord. We do ask that you just work on people's hearts and work on their uh, life, Lord, where they might just are not just persuaded, Lord. Send people in their way that they preach the word to them and open people's hearts and ears, God, that we can be uh, a servants to you, Lord. I pray this in your almighty name, Jesus. Amen.